Even with the massive pixel counts of today's best available cameras, we still need to resize our images for large prints. In this tutorial, we'll compare the resizing algorithms in Photoshop versus the very popular Gigapixel AI to see which is best for your needs, and more importantly, which settings to optimize for beautiful prints. I've opened up a copy of a finished image in Photoshop, and as you can see, it's a layered document, which is not the starting point you want for enlargement. We want to select everything by shift-clicking, right-click, and flatten. No adjustment layers, no smart objects, no multiple layers, just a single flat layer. Of course, do this to a duplicate of your image, not to your original working document, but this is the starting point you want for enlargement. Once you have that, we can begin the process in Photoshop by going up to Image, Image Size, and here you have just a few options. You choose the output size, resolution, and the mechanism you want to use. For the size, you can just go and choose whatever units you want. I'm going to go and shoot for 40 by 60. So when I put in 60, that will match because I've got this link checked to the proportional 40. So it's almost exactly what I need. I'll have to crop off a little bit at the tail end, but you don't want to turn this off and force that in there. If you type the exact value on both, then it's gonna squish your pixels. You definitely wanna make sure you have this link on to get them to be proportional. So I'm gonna put in again 60. So that's the right size. It's already at 300 pixels per inch, which is my preferred output, and generally speaking, a really good option. And then you wanna make sure you check resample. If you don't check this, then you're not gonna get an enlargement. You're just gonna change some numbers that don't mean anything until you check resample. And then you choose the method. And this is where you wanna choose preserve details enlargement. That's the best one to choose. You might think, well, Preserve Details 2.0 sounds like it's better, but really the original version I find, generally speaking, has better detail and contrast, and I would recommend that you use this, but of course, try it and see what you like. Then you just have one option, which is the Reduce Noise Slider, and what you'd want to do is go zoom in on some area of sky. Maybe something that's not quite so bright, but something like this, and you can kind of click before and after and see there actually is a bit of noise there. If I turn off the noise reduction, you see that it is bringing out a little teeny bit of noise. You may not notice it online here. It's like gonna zoom in more, but there is a bit of noise in that sky. So you can turn this up to suppress that noise. Here, I think just 5% completely wipes it out and is a great choice. If you're working with a high ISO night image, you might wanna go all the way up to something like 25% or even more. Just depends on the image, but set it to the lowest value you can get away with or use some other mechanism for reducing noise if you need to, and then just click okay. And about 10 seconds later, Photoshop is going to spit out our resized image using the Preserve Details 1.0 algorithm. And you can see we've got a whole lot more pixels to work with. Now, instead of going through and reviewing the quality right now, I'm going to come back later. I've already done this for both methods, and we'll compare that at the end. Let's instead start back at the beginning and take a look at the gigapixel approach just to see how it compares. So I'm going to go click back to my opening in history and start over. So I'm gonna shift click to select all my layers, right click and flatten. So no matter what method you use, you always wanna work from a flattened layer. Now we can invoke Gigapixel, which I have installed as a plugin to Photoshop. You might think to look under the filter menu because so many of the third-party plugins go in here, but it is not a filter. You can't use it on a smart object. So instead of being on the filter menu, it's actually under the file menu under automate. May not be a place you normally look, but this is where it lives, and you see Topaz Gigapixel AI. If you've installed it and you don't see the plugin, sometimes it just doesn't get installed, and what you can do is go to the installer and manually copy it to the right folder in Photoshop, and I'll have all the details for that in the written version of this tutorial. But once you've got it, just click on this to invoke the plugin interface. And you can see here we have this nice large preview. If your screen starts off something smaller like this, just click and drag from the bottom right and really fill up the screen to get a nice generous preview. What you're looking at here is going to be a low quality enlargement on the left. It's actually using the bilinear mechanism if you're to do this in Photoshop versus all the nice refinements you get on the right based on the slider value. So this is how you can optimize by looking at this preview on the right. Let's go and move this over something like this tree and now we'll get a nice comparison to figure out what settings we want to use on the right. And the first thing we need to figure out is the size. It's no use to preview until you have the correct size. You get a few different options here in this resize mode. Scale is probably not something you're going to use, but you can go in and punch in like double the resolution or 4x, whatever you want to put in. Um, but I would just generally say you're going to go right to width or height. So you pick one and it'll set the other. So if I punch in, 
60 inches here, and you can click on this drop down to choose pixels or centimeters and 300 pixels per inch. Then it's already gone and updated my preview. And down below here, this is what's telling you the output size. So I set 60 and I'm going to get 40.04, just like in Photoshop, it's the same math. But the key thing is just making sure I have at least 40 inches because I'm going to crop it down to 40 at the end of this whole process. So I've got the right size. I'm good to go. And we can move on to the various settings here that control the quality. And the first one is this AI mode. AI is artificial intelligence. And you're basically telling it what kind of image are you working with? Standard is going to be the right choice 90% of the time. If you're working on landscape, it's probably the only thing you'll ever use. Architectural, when you click on this, it's going to update and it would be appropriate for something like a cityscape or something with fine detail. And we'll take a look at how these compare. In fact, we may need to zoom in a little bit, but if we look at standard versus architectural, there's more detail in this tree in the architectural version. I'm going to zoom in to 200%, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend at home, but over YouTube, I think it's helpful to compare these. So let's let it render the architectural. Let's look at the standard. And see, we've got really nice tree detail here in the standard. We click architectural, we do get more detail, but I think it has kind of a, a painterly look. It's got some weird color. It's, it's really not the choice that I would use, but you know, until you print it, it's hard to say. One of these may win out over the other. You should do a test print and see what you think. But my gut is to say that standard is gonna be the winner here. And again, bear in mind, we're looking at it at 200%, so it's really quite close. But look at the detail we have on the right-hand side versus the left. I mean, this is clearly just a much nicer looking image on the right-hand side. It's doing tremendous work to bring out all the extra detail, the bark and these background trees. I mean, these look nice and sharp and these almost look like they're out of focus without the, you know, the AI doing its magic. Next up are the settings. And this is the key section for optimizing your results. It would be totally reasonable to click auto and just leave it on auto all the time. You're gonna get results that are so close to the best results that for most prints, it's not gonna make a difference. But if you really wanna tweak things for the best results, then you can turn this off and dial these sliders in manually to get the results that you want. So let's take a look at what these two do. The first one's pretty obvious. Suppress noise is gonna try and clean up any noise. Let's go look at the sky and just compare. And so right now with its default recommendation at 20, Things look pretty nice and clean on the right hand side here. There's not much noise. If we go and turn this off and look at the value of zero, you can see there is quite a bit of noise here that's being brought forth. So the noise suppression is helpful and the 20 value is a pretty good choice. You don't want to go any higher than you need to. It's just like in Photoshop. So I think 20 would be a pretty good choice here and we'll just stick with that. If this was a high ISO night image, you might go a lot higher than this. So it really is image dependent. And the nice thing about this auto is that it will adapt to your image. So when you're shooting a night image, it's going to recommend a higher level of noise suppression. So it, it really is doing a really nice job. Then we have remove blur, which I think is kind of a confusing name. I really think of this as adding sharpening. So if we turn this off, we get the base value here and then turn all the way to the maximum 100. And now we can just kind of compare without it to with it. It's not doing a whole lot to the sky. The trees are obviously getting more detailed. Let's go look at another area of the image that has more detail. Like we'll come back to the same tree. That was a good impression. So here with the maximum detail, maybe like this, make sure we see some extra leaves here and turn it off. And you just see how there's none versus with it. And it's not, you know, night and day in this case in terms of what it's going to do to print but there's no question that it's bringing out some great detail. I mean, watch the shadow areas back here with nothing to after. It really, it does have a pretty strong effect when you're looking close at 200%. But you know, again, when you print this, I don't know how much that's gonna show up in a print. It's, it's gonna be a little more subtle. And I think that the AI's recommendation around 80 is probably about right here. I like what it's doing, but maybe not going all the way to full strength. So it did a nice job of recommending some good slider values here. Then lastly, couple of options here. You have this reduce color bleed, which is a, there's just really no good way to summarize this slider. And, and I don't think reduce color bleed captures what it does. When you turn this on, it's really going to mess with shadow values from before to after. Look at the shadow detail here. You see that you kind of minimize some of the deeper areas and you add a little bit more 
detail throughout the leaves and other areas with this on. I wouldn't say that it has a strong effect in terms of what you're going to see in a print, but I would definitely toggle this and see which one you like. And you can see some things like these point light sources are actually being affected fairly strongly. So it is an important slider. It's a little hard to predict. And I would just simply say, go look at a couple areas. Maybe we'll take a look at another area like here and just see with it on versus with it off. And now toggle back and forth. And I think it actually has less impact here than it did there. We can go look at another area like the foreground, you know, maybe take a look at some of these rocks here, see what it's going to do. And, you know, again, not a whole lot of effect. I would just leave it off as I normally do, but it's worth just trying a few areas and see what you think. Uh, lastly is face refinement. We don't have any people in this shot, but it does just what you would think, which is to try and improve the quality of results when you have a person's face visible in the image. So if you've got a portrait, try this slider. Otherwise, that's it. Those are all the options. And just click apply and then go do something else. Sit back and wait because this is going to take a long time. There's no other way to put it. It took 10 seconds for the Photoshop version. This one is going to take upwards of 40 minutes most of the time for me, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes longer. It depends on how fast your machine is and how much you're enlarging it. But this is definitely not the quick choice. So I'm going to cancel it and I've already processed results. We can compare things. And uh, notice here, even though I canceled, I did spit out this extra layer. So it's got kind of like a reference layer and then it's results, but these can be ignored here since we canceled it. Let's go look at the actual results I got here. And what I have in blue are versions that were created from Photoshop. So all of these are gonna be this uh, doubling in size is what I created here. So roughly 40 by 60. And I've got the Photoshop auto version as my baseline reference. Let's zoom in and just see you know, if you left things at auto in Photoshop versus using preserved details, we're at a little over 100%. So maybe I'll just go into about 200%, make it easier to see. Turning on preserved details, it is absolutely adding some more detail. It's subtle, but there's no question that it looks better with preserved details 1.0. For comparison, I got preserved details 2.0. And in this case, it looks almost a little artifacted. I don't like the shadows as much. And as usual, I just prefer the look of the original preserved details method. This is at 0% uh, noise reduction. So taking a look at the sky here uh, compared to the auto version, you know, there's really not a whole lot of noise, but I probably should have added a little bit of noise reduction to this, but barely going to be noticeable in a print. But I, I would go back and, and do this for a print a little bit differently. Then up in purple here, I have the outputs from Gigapixel. The bottom here is the bilinear version it spits out, which is just very simple. And as you can see, it's quite soft. If we compare that to what comes out of Photoshop, you see how little detail it has. We're going to the auto, it has less detail. So I would say this is a quick and dirty thing for Gigapixel to create. It's kind of misleading. It's not very comparable to the best thing you can get in Photoshop. Just know that whatever you see as the reference from Gigapixel, it's not as good as what you'd get out of Photoshop. And I think if you're going to blend Gigapixel in with a reference image, I would blend it with something you created in Photoshop rather than what came out of Gigapixel because you can do better than this. But, you know, I think for marketing purposes, it makes their stuff look really good. So then let's take a look at the actual comparison here when we turn on the results. So looking at zero noise and zero on that sharpening slider, the blur slider. And you see a huge difference. So let's compare it to the best of Photoshop. So preserve details versus Gigapixel. And here's Photoshop, here's Gigapixel. Hands down, Gigapixel looks better to me. There's much more detail. It looks slightly artifacted at 200% here. You zoom back to 100% and there's just no comparison that Gigapixel has done a better job. And in my opinion, is well worth waiting 40 minutes to get this kind of result. Let's move around a little bit and just take a look at things like water. Again, it looks better here, better texture in that water. Zooming down to the waves. Those are really pretty similar. We get down into the rocks here. It's subtle, but a little bit better for Gigapixel. If we get up into the tree line where it's hitting the sky, compare that. That's what's really shining. This tree detail just, I think, stands out so much from Gigapixel, really like that result. Let's go back to that same tree here. That seemed to be a pretty good reference. And I'm zooming to 200%, and you just see Photoshop versus Gigapixel. And this is the baseline with nothing added to it. If you want to do your sharpening primarily in Photoshop, 
this is the version I'd start from. Maybe add a little bit more noise reduction, but having none of this blur reduction would be a good starting point to add your own custom sharpening in Photoshop. Of course, if you want the best initial look, you could kick in some more. So we go to the 40 slider. You see you're getting a little more detail here. It's not terribly strong, but it's improving things. If we go up to 80, which was the recommended blur, there's no question that it has a pretty strong effect. Just comparing zero to 80, it's really starting to add more detail. It doesn't look overly sharpened. I mean, I, I think it looks great and I would go with the 80 blur here. I think it's a better looking result. And then if we add in the noise reduction it recommended with 20, watch what happens here. Even when you're not looking at noise in the sky, it has some interesting effects on the image. These background trees here look a little bit more defined with the noise reduction. I'd say the bark maybe loses a little definition. It's kind of a you know hit or miss. I think in some ways it's better, in some ways it's worse. And you might ultimately blend these if you want the noise reduction in the sky. But I, I think overall, when you zoom back to 100%, which is more of a fair comparison that uh, with the noise reduction on looks great and there's no negatives down here. When we get up into the sky, let's take a look at this here and look with no noise reduction, there's absolutely noise visible in the sky versus at the recommended 20. It's nice and clean. So recommended slider values came out great, but you know now you know how you optimize them. And there definitely are some cases where optimizing them further can give you a better result. And one of those cases I think would be when you go to a tougher image. So here I have an ISO 6400 image of the Aurora Borealis. It's about as nasty as it gets. You can't stack multiple images and you can't use longer shutters when you're shooting the Aurora because it's moving. And so you get one shot. It's a super noisy image at a wide aperture. It's pretty brutal. And let's take a look at how things worked out here. I'm just gonna zoom in to an area of detail. Let's get this all the way down to 100% and just look at preserved details, which I used 25% noise reduction here, versus compared to gigapixel with no noise reduction and 50% blur reduction. And I would say their level of detail is a little bit better, and the level of noise is obviously much higher in gigapixel because I've not yet added it. So let's take a look at 50% noise reduction. And in this case, I would say that gigapixel is still showing more noise. So these percentages are not comparable. They're different tools and they respond differently. So even at 50%, Gigapixel is not reducing the noise as much as Photoshop was at 25%. And notice there's some interesting things starting to happen. See this detail here. There's a lot of noise here and not so much here. And in fact, let me zoom back and I marked one area to compare here. Uh, here we go, up in this red zone here. This is where an AI can get you into trouble. Artificial intelligence is pattern recognition, and sometimes it does strange things. Let's turn off this little marker here. And if we look at preserved details versus gigapixel at this level of noise reduction, things look pretty good. I'd say gigapixel kind of wins, but look at what happens when we kick up the noise reduction to 100%. So this very strange thing where gigapixel has totally wiped out the noise in this part of the sky, and it's left it here and strongly here. This is not what I would want to print. So even though some areas of the image look better at 100%, you gotta watch the small details. I mean, this is a very small part of the image. A lot of the rest of the sky looks reasonable. So when you're working with Gigapixel or any sort of AI solution, you wanna check and make sure it gave you a good result. I'm not saying this is the wrong version to use, but it simply may be a case where you wanna blend these together. I could put a layer mask on this and blend it in with this version and perhaps get the best of both worlds. If I zoom back out, we'll see there's other places where it's beneficial. So I marked over here, if we zoom in, watch the detail in this tree. I mean, it's really nicely defined when I have my 100% noise reduction and 50% blur reduction versus when I turn the noise reduction halfway, it has more noise, but it just doesn't make the details crisp either. So when the noise gets out of the way, the sharpening seems to do a better job. It has a clear idea of what it's working with. And so, you know, you just got to play with these things and look around, but parts of this image are going to be better with one setting and parts are going to be better with another setting. And the best thing you do is just, you know, add a layer mask and start blending those together. But let's just kind of quickly take a look around a few other parts of this image here, just comparing this result versus what came out of Photoshop. There's no question that Gigapixel did an awesome job here. 
I need to deal with the fact that the noise is intermittent, but that's not something that I'm you know, afraid to deal with and it's worth the extra detail. So I'm really pretty pleased with Gigapixel, even though it's imperfect on a challenging image like this. So just check it, spend a little time to blend it together. And I think you'll be really pleased with the results you get out of Gigapixel if you're willing to wait. Otherwise, Preserve Details is great for speed. You don't have to pay for another piece of software. And it's great for working into like actions in Photoshop if you want to fully automate your workflow. Now click to this next video to learn more about how to get great results in Photoshop.